You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. In just a few moments, we're going to be looking at John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, and we're going to be talking about the fact that the broken find healing in Jesus. But before we take a look at that, just a couple quick things I wanted to share with you. As I do each week, I wanted to invite you to our website, which is desirejesus.com. I actually have it pulled up on my screen right now. And on the website, we're always adding new content here, particularly to the blog, but we also have links to both of our podcasts at desirejesus.com as well. And we'd encourage you to check it out because our purpose in putting this website together is to provide a source for spiritual encouragement, that we would all find joy and hope and satisfaction in Christ. And that's the whole idea behind naming the site Desire Jesus. He's the one that ultimately satisfies the longings and the desires of our hearts. And so if you've never checked out the website, definitely stop by there. It's mobile friendly, so you can check it out from your phone. Or if you've got an iPad or a full screen computer. It's very easy to navigate and check out. Lots of resources there. So we've got our blog, which has detailed Bible studies that you'll be able to find there and follow along with. We have both of our podcasts linked there. And we also have our bookstore. And the book that I want to highlight this month from our bookstore is the Desire Jesus One Year Devotional. It's the longest book I've ever written, but it's a 365-day devotional that was written with the goal of encouraging, refreshing, and strengthening your daily walk with Christ. It's available in both paperback and Kindle editions if you use a Kindle device or use the Kindle app on your phone or your iPad or something like that. But definitely check it out, particularly as we make preparations to begin a new year. The Desire Jesus One Year Devotional we think will be a valuable resource for you to have. Now, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, today we're looking at John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, and we're talking about the fact that the broken find healing in Jesus. Let's take a look together. But we've been talking about the fact that Christ's role as our Savior is a vital thing and an important thing, and we've been looking at some of the things that Scripture tells us about what He does when He saves and what His saving activity looks like. And today we're talking about the fact that in Christ, the broken find healing. And we're going to take a look together at John chapter 5. So if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. So it's not a very long portion of Scripture, but it's a a very interesting and a very poignant uh, portion of Scripture. John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. This is what we see in this passage. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of individuals, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to read it together today. And Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture, as we see what you do with the broken, the fact that you bring healing to the broken, we pray, Lord, that we would understand this concept better. And particularly during this time of year where our attention is brought to you through just a variety of reminders, we pray, Lord, that we would give you praise for being our Savior, the one who rescues, the one who redeems, the promised Messiah. Lord, you're all these things, and we're grateful for it. And we're grateful for a portion of Scripture like this that illustrates the fact that you came to this earth so that the broken could find healing in you. And we're grateful for this reminder from your word today, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Um, I saw, now I didn't see this, I was told this just a little bit ago, and I didn't realize this, but the power was out to this section of town for a few hours. In fact, a few hours ago, uh, it was still out, and it just came on, I guess, about six in the morning. So I'm grateful that the power is on this morning. Power being off uh, affects a variety of things. You might wake up and actually... Uh, find yourself taking a cold shower or something like that that's not always a pleasant surprise. Uh, the water heater in our home is starting to get old. It was there before we bought the house for a few years, and now we've owned the house for about 10 years. And a while back, I actually started noticing that an internal breaker in the water heater was tripping. And the way I would notice it is I'd wake up and I'd go to take a shower and discover my shower is freezing cold. <laughs> that breaker must have tripped last night. And so for a while, I got into the habit of before I went to bed, just went through the house, checked on things, went down. My final stop was always to go down to the water heater, reset the breaker on it, then go to bed with the hope that I would have warm water and my family would have warm water in the morning when we were getting up and getting ready. And eventually that got annoying because it didn't seem like it was working all that well, and it was tripping now every day. And so I thought, all right, there's something obviously wrong with this. So I took a look at it, figured out what I needed to do to fix it. I bought the parts, including a very uniquely shaped socket wrench uh, that's really good for pulling, the plumber's laughing, right? You know, it's good for uh, uh, pulling out, um, you know, the heating element. And I removed the heating element that was causing problems. I replaced it with a new element. And since then, we've had zero problems with the water heater. And that's been a little while now. We're all very happy about it. I was also very happy that the whole process cost me less than $20. It was a good day in the Stange household. Um, but truthfully, it doesn't surprise any of us when one of our appliances break, right? I mean, maybe if you just got it, but if it's been around for a while you kind of think, well, it was inevitable. These things break. You know, they're useful until they stop working. We usually expect it. We usually do our best to try and fix what was broken, or we try and hire someone to fix what was broken. But the truth is, appliances are not the only things that break. People break too. In fact, there's more than one way to be broken. Humanity experiences spiritual brokenness and relational brokenness, and emotional brokenness, and financial brokenness, and physical brokenness, every day, in all sorts of contexts. And the scripture we're looking at today is a beautiful scripture because it reminds us that Jesus delights to heal broken people. He loves to heal broken people. He finds us in the condition we were in, and then he offers to do something about it. So as we continue this brief look that we're, we're taking at Christ's role as our Savior, the one who heals the broken, today we're just looking at a, a portion here of John chapter 5 that demonstrates that it is Christ's desire to heal the broken. Now, one of the things that we could see in the portion of Scripture that we're looking at today is the fact that there is no shortage of broken people in this world. Look again at verse 1 down to verse 3. Let me reread those verses. They say this. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. And then it says in verse 3, it says, In these lay a multitude of individuals, blind, lame, and paralyzed. A multitude. Now, during the era of Christ's earthly ministry, there were three annual feasts that were celebrated by the Jewish people, and the Jewish men in particular were required to, dra uh, to travel to, to Jerusalem for these feasts. So you had Passover, you had Pentecost, and you had the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Shelters. It's referred to by any one of those three. And people have tried to guess, in looking at this portion of Scripture from John chapter 5, which one of these feasts is being referenced here? Which one of these feasts of the Jews? But no one's completely sure. There's all different guesses as to which one it may be, and there's good reason to believe it might be one over the other. But the truth is, it doesn't specifically say... So no one's really completely sure, and so it makes me wonder why it was even mentioned here. But I think that John, as he was writing these things down, 
maybe just simply mentioned it to indicate why Jesus happened to be in Jerusalem at that particular time, or it very well may be that John was trying to illustrate that Jesus was intent on keeping the regulations of the law. That might be part of the reason that he illustrated that and mentioned that here in this passage. But we're told here that in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there was a pool called Bethesda. Now, isn't it interesting when you hear the word Bethesda, don't, don't you automatically, in our context, think of a hospital, a place of healing? Isn't it interesting that, that we've appropriated some of these words from you know, the biblical narrative into our modern-day context, recognizing the, you know, just, just kind of like a connection with this thought in our mind of healing? And here it says, the pool was called Bethesda, and we're told that multitudes of the people would lay near that pool, hoping to be miraculously healed. Now, uh, if you're using the Bibles that we have here in the chairs, you're using the English Standard Version. And I paused reading there at verse 3. Take a look really quickly at verse 4. Some of you are looking puzzled. You're like, wait, there's no verse 4. Why does it go from verse 3 to verse 5? Did anyone else notice that? Yeah? All right. Margie noticed it. Yeah. Yeah. It goes from verse 3 to... Why is there no verse 4 there? Well, some translations actually include a verse 4, um, but uh, it's, uh, the understanding is that verse 4 that is included in some translations isn't necessarily a part of inspired Scripture. It's actually believed that it was like a scribal clarification, almost like a parenthesis that was inserted there maybe at some point by a scribe to kind of give some context as to what was being talked about in some of these verses. But basically... In that scribal note that you won't see in the translation that, that we use here, uh, but in that scribal note, we're told that the people believed that what was taking place at this pool at Bethesda, uh, they believed that an angel would come and would stir the waters of the pool. And the first person to get into the water after that, that water was stirred, they believed that that person would be miraculously healed of their disease or afflictions. So they would gather around this, and they would look at the water, and they would wait for there to be some sort of movement in the water, and the thought was an angel had stirred it, and if you were the first one in, you were going to potentially be miraculously healed. That was their belief. Now, in desperation, so you can imagine the people that are gathered around this pool, um, I think that we can understand why those with physical infirmities might be tempted to believe in that kind of superstition as they're gathered around the pool. Uh, because what other options did they have? It's not like they had a whole bunch of options, right? And have, there wasn't, you know, like, like a plan B that they could uh, uh, utilize in regard to these things. You know, I'm sure that many of them had already attempted all the medical options that they could think of, all the medical options that were suggested to them by their friends or their family members or people in the community, and they tried these things, and obviously those things didn't work. So they look at this, and they're like, well, we, you know, we don't have any other option. This will be the plan B. We will sit around the pool. We will lay around the pool. We will wait for the water to get stirred and then try to be the first one in after the water gets stirred, gets stirred and maybe then we will be miraculously healed by an angel. So that's what they're thinking. At best, they're going to be healed. At worst, at least they get to spend some time with people that may understand their condition because of the things that they're going through themselves. So there maybe is a little bit of a sense of community, but also, can you just imagine, like, there's in one moment a sense of community, and then in another moment, you know, just a little breeze goes by, right? And it's like, did the water just stir? The water just, you know, that community turns into competition immediately, right? You know, people throwing elbows, trying to get in there, doing whatever they need to do. If you got a friend to help lift you in, you know, just, could you imagine the chaos? Like, little, just a little stir, a bug lands on it. I, I see ripples. Throwing your friend in, right? It's like, we'll get you out in a second. Just got to get you to, you know, I spent all day here waiting for the water to move. I'm throwing you in. We're not going to tiptoe. We got to beat all those people. And it says there were multitudes here. Now, I don't know what you think about crowds. Anyone here happen to like crowds? All right. Crowds can be a little bit challenging, right? I'm not always a huge fan of them. I remember one point uh, right before 
oh, let's see, it was playoff season, and my wife and I uh, were up in uh, the Boston area. We are in Boston uh, when the Red Sox were, were they had a, a home playoff game, and we tried to get on the T, so the train, you know, traveling from Boston to where we were staying. And we got on, and everything was fine. And then it loaded up with everyone who had just come out of that game, and we kept watching the train fill and fill and fill, and we're just, it literally got to the point where whatever position you were in, you had to stay in that position. If you had your arms up on a railing, you can keep your arm up. But if you didn't have your arm up, there was no way to get your arm up. It was that crammed. I've never been so crammed in my life. So if you were claustrophobic, this would not be a moment for you. And, you know, in that moment, what are you doing? You're, you're jammed all in together. You're sweating because people are making you warm, but then you're also kind of covered in everybody else's sweat and filth, right? And you're just like jammed in so close that you're like, I don't even stand this close to my wife, you know? And now I've got this guy that just came from this game that is like closer to me than any human has ever been, right? This is awkward. This is not something that I enjoy. I don't enjoy being schizophrenic, and or not schizophrenic. Well, maybe I am. We'll see. Uh, claustrophobic is the word I meant to use. Um, I don't enjoy. Listen, there's a lot of maladies. All right, you see the point. <laughs> but the scripture tells us here there's a multitude of people, and they're all gathered around this pool, and they're all hurting. They're all. They all have something that is a major concern that they don't feel like they have any other option to actually deal with it. Well, how many is a multitude? I mean, it uses this word multitude. How many is a multitude? Well, if you look, there's no definitive answer for how many a multitude is, but typically you use that word when there are too many people to count. That's when you use that word, when you can't just easily count the people visually. You just use the word multitude. So multitude, so many people there that it wouldn't be naturally easy to count. And as optimistic as we may be, and I certainly consider myself an optimistic person, but if we're honest, we need to admit that there is no shortage of broken people in this world. Even if you're an optimist, and again, I'm an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, but there is no shortage of broken people of this world. In every corner of this world, whether we're looking locally, whether we branch out a little bit further, whether we go to a distant place that we've never been before, there are multitudes of people whose lives and whose spirits and whose bodies are broken. For various reasons, people are hurting. But the biggest reason, and I hope you'll hear me as I say this, The biggest reason hurt remains in the inner person is because we don't yet understand what can make us well. Or better yet said, we don't understand who can make us well. I like what Jesus said in Luke chapter 5. It says, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What's Christ talking about there? He's talking about the greatest need that we have, our our area of deepest brokenness on the spiritual level that only Christ can medicate, that only Christ can heal. This world may be filled with broken people. It certainly is filled with broken people, but Jesus, Scripture reveals to us, is the great physician who offers ultimate healing. And yet still, the irony of the situation is that many persist in their brokenness because not everybody wants to be healed. Not everybody wants to be healed. Look again in uh, the Scripture we're looking at today in John chapter 5. Let's jump down to verse 5. And in verse 5 down to verse 7, it says this, One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. So let's pause there for just a second. So among the multitude of people that were lying down near this pool, right, all these people laying there, 
You have one man in particular that the Scripture tells us was singled out by Jesus. And we're told that the man had been an invalid for 38 years, and for a long time he's been lying here near this pool. For nearly four decades, the Scripture tells us, so for 38 years, this man had been unable to walk, and he was very much dependent on whatever care other people might be willing to offer him. He couldn't care for many of his own needs, so he was dependent on the care that others could offer him. He was even dependent on the kindness of others to try and get him into the pool when the water was stirred. But when you look at what the context of the Scripture seems to indicate, at this point it, it doesn't appear that there's a friend or a family member that's remained to help him saying, I have no one that can help me get into the water when it's stirred. And when I'm thinking about that, so when I read stuff like that, I often try and think, what was going on in this man's life that would bring him to that point? Well, he says he's been an invalid for 38 years. So 38 years. So how old is this guy? You know, I mean, he's at least older than that, right? So, I mean, he's, he's you know, well into his adult years. And I actually wonder if at that point in this man's life, I wonder if those that used to care for him had either passed away or maybe even abandoned him. Because think about that. 38 years, that's a long time to provide care for someone, isn't it? And it made me wonder. I thought, you know, I wonder if at that point maybe his parents weren't around any longer. And maybe those that at one point tried to offer him care for a season finally got tired of it and gave up. Either way, he's alone. He's alone. And he's struggling with this, and he's the one that Jesus singles out. So Jesus asks this man a question. And I think on the surface, it's probably easy to look at this question and say, is that kind of a silly question to ask? Because what does Jesus ask him? He says, do you want to be healed? That's the question he poses to this man. Do you want to be healed? And again, I think many people looking at this would be like, that's kind of a silly question. Of course the man wants to be healed, right? But I think it's a very reasonable question. And I think it's a reasonable question to pose to this man who's been an invalid, according to the Scripture, for 38 years. Because apart from Christ, there's a huge void in our souls that we're desperate to fill. And people try to fill that void. And by the way, every one of us in this room has done this. So we're not talking about other people, we're really just talking about us. And if you're introspective right now, you'll find something that fits this statement I'm about to make. But people attempt, we attempt, to fill that void with all sorts of things, hoping that something is going to eventually work. Um, During the course of my adult life, one of the things that stood out to me, something that I, I would probably put in the category of one of the more tragic observances of humanity is the fact that not everyone who has an infirmity wants to be made well. Not everybody wants to be made well. And what I mean by that is this. Many people begin to adopt their infirmity as their identity. They're trying to use it to fill the void, right? And without their infirmity, they start struggling to actually say, like, you know, I don't, I don't know who I am without the infirmity. That infirmity is kind of the thing that's defined me for so long. It's the thing I'm best known for. It's the thing I get the most attention about. So there's their sense of self, their sense of, uh, or their means of receiving attention. Uh, and the solution to fill the void in their soul in many respects can sometimes all come back to that infirmity that they've been wrestling with. And as strange as it may seem, some people start nurturing and caring for their infirmities for this very reason because they've been using it to try and fill that void of the soul. Now, let me ask this in a personal way. I I know I won't answer it for us. I've wrestled with this myself. But what are some of the infirmities that we might be attempted to adopt as our identity? I just want you to think about that for a moment just in your own mind. What are some infirmities that you personally might actually be tempted to adopt as if it's a form of your identity? Or let me, I could ask it this way too. What kind of tragedies have we been have we been the victim of that maybe we've started to think about them like it's a badge of honor to have been victimized by those events? You know, if someone asks you, who are you? Do you begin by describing yourself as a victim or a sur- survivor of an infirmity or a tragedy? 
And I bring that up because after 38 years, do you suppose that there was a risk that this man who's laying alongside this pool of water, this man that Jesus is now speaking to, that he might have struggled with this as well? You know, do you, do you suppose it was entirely possible that this man might not actually want to get well? I think it's distinctly possible. I think that could be part of why Jesus is posing this as a question, because I, I could, and you've probably dealt with this too, but sadly, I can tell you that I've spoken to and I've counseled with many people who, in the end, demonstrated that at least for now, they did not want to get well. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a man named Brian Welch. He actually goes by the nickname Head. So Brian Head Welch. You ever hear that name? I'm just scanning the room to see if anyone. Very few have heard the name. Oh, okay, I see a couple definitive yeses on Brian uh, Welch. He used to be part of the band Corn. Let's see, I have a picture of them. Is anyone right? This picture is from a while ago. This is Brian, by the way. This is Brian Head Welch. And uh, this is uh, when the band Korn was receiving, uh, said this was a video music award they were receiving. I think this, this picture might be from like 1999, somewhere in that vicinity. And um, he has a very interesting story that's come to light in recent years. He walked away from being part of that band. And that band was huge. The band Korn spelled with a K, by the way. That's how you know it's cool. Regular corn, eh, not so much. Spell it with a K, you're huge, right? And, and he walked away, he walked away from the band, even, be, the, he, imagine this, after being offered a $23 million contract. $23 million is what he was offered. And he walked away from it after he came to know Christ. He came to know Christ and decided that the Lord was calling him to walk away from that because in addition to the band lifestyle and the fame and the notoriety and the wealth and all these things that were temptations that were being thrown at him every day, he was dealing with a variety of addictions. And he was dealing with a variety of other issues as well that kind of worked hand in hand with his addictions. But it took him a while before he was willing to truly get well. And I read an article that quoted him recently, and this is why I wanted to share this this morning uh, related to what he said, but let me quote him real quick. He says, I think the root was the self-hatred that was going on due to unresolved issues growing up, Welch explained. He said, I didn't have the best relationship with my dad. I was bullied in school. I was picked on. I remember the first time I'm just trying to connect with girls. It was just rejection after rejection. So I always felt ugly. Every time I looked in the mirror, it was like, you're not good enough. There's always someone more popular. There's always someone more gifted in music. Then he said, I feel like I was too sensitive to things. And they would get to me. And I'd let them just tear me down. And no matter how successful I got later on, I just felt like if people really got to know me, if they really got close to me, they wouldn't like me. And that's the lie I believed about myself, and so I would just mask it with drugs and alcohol for years and years and years. And then he said, it wasn't until I found my faith that I learned to love myself. Once he started to recognize his identity in Christ, once he started to realize that in Christ he was loved, then he was able to show love to himself, and he was able to start getting well. So how about us? Because that story is not that different from us. Subtract the $23 million part. <laughs> but the rest of it's pretty similar, right? Do we want to get well? Do we want to be healed? Now, you may or may not have a physical addiction or a physical infirmity that you're struggling with. You may have something like that. You may not have something like that. But regardless... What does your relationship with Christ look like? And as an outpouring of that, what does your relationship with others look like? And what does the message that you're preaching to your heart sound like? The healing that Christ offers is more than skin deep. He desires to heal the whole person, and He can fill that nagging void 
in your soul. I thought Brian Welch articulated the sounds of that void very well in, in sharing his testimony. But we've all wrestled with the same exact thing. And when Christ heals us, He initiates a relationship of trust. We're called to trust Him to forgive our sin. We're called uh, to trust Him to remain with us in all circumstances. We're also called to trust Him to live in obedience to Him. But we all need a little encouragement to move in that direction. That's not a direction we naturally move into. And so the man Jesus was speaking to in John chapter 5, he needed a little encouragement to take this step as well. So Jesus told him to get up and walk. And that's where I want to finish this morning. Look at, again with me at verses 8 and 9. In verse, verses 8 and 9 it says this, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now, at the risk of, of, of turning our worship service today too much into a, into a counseling session, let me ask this. Have you ever experienced a season when you felt depressed and anxious, and you couldn't really put your finger on what the cause was? You ever go through a season like that where you're, you're feeling depressed or you're feeling anxious and you're saying to yourself, I can't quite put my finger on what the cause of this is, but I know that this is what I'm feeling. I've certainly gone through seasons like that. I'm assuming I'm not the only person. And I think there's a couple things that are useful to wrestle with when we're going through seasons like that. I think in those moments, it's good to ask the Lord to show you if there's an area of unrepented sin in your life. And if He shows you something, give it over to Him and walk in the freedom that Christ has purchased for you. But I also think it's wise to understand that if, uh, you know, maybe you can't identify uh, an area where you're nurturing a secret sin, and maybe that's not even the issue. Maybe you're not, you know, like holding on to something that you shouldn't hold on to. There's still a spiritual battle taking place. And I'm convinced that one of Satan's favorite ways to attack believers, to, you know, just like try and really mess things up for followers of Christ, is to attack our emotions. And in seasons like that, I've personally asked the Lord, and I'd encourage you to ask the Lord the same on your behalf, but I've asked the Lord to shield me from those kind of arrows of Satan, those, those arrows of depression or those arrows of anxiety. And by the way, I've watched the Lord answer those prayers. So I do think that there's a spiritual battle that facilitates many of these things. And when you look at this kind of passage, when you see John chapter 5 and the things that are outlined here, you have Jesus demonstrating a hopeful remedy for those who have been broken by discouragement, for those who have been broken by despair, for those who have been broken by sin. You have Jesus looking at this man, and this man, again, he hasn't walked in almost four decades, right? And he looks at the man and he says, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And the Scripture tells us that in that moment, the man was healed, and he obeyed Christ's command. That's what we see in this portion of Scripture. He stood up, he picked up his... Just think about this, Matt, for a second, this bedding. right? He picks up this gross smelly mat. You think this thing's like pristine? Like this thing's gross, right? This, this thing smells like the bad stuff that anything can smell like, right? And he's just been laying in it all this time. He doesn't have anyone to help him move. This is a mess. This isn't a pretty picture. There's probably multiple reasons why people avoid this guy. And the smell probably was one of them. And Jesus looks at him and he says, take your mat. You know, he says, get up, take your bed, and walk. And so the man stands up, he picks up that gross, sweaty, smelly mat, and he walks. Now, he'd watched others walk for years and years and years, decades he's watched others walk, wishing that he could do that too. And now he could. And we won't spend a lot of time, you know, going into this, but later in this chapter, in John chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus cautioned this man when he sees him a little bit later on, and he says, see, you are well. And then he looks at him and he says, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. It actually appears that this man's infirmity had a direct connection to unrepented sin in his life. 
But in this act, and I think in, the, in, uh, in many other acts as well, what you have is you have Jesus fulfilling what the Scriptures have prophesied about the coming Messiah. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 35. In Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, it says, And when He comes, so speaking of, of the Messiah, speaking of the Savior, it says, And when He comes, He will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. That's what the Scripture says about the Messiah. This is what we see Jesus fulfilling in this portion of Scripture. Now, I don't know who to ultimately credit this statement to. Uh, I first heard it from a man named Michael Hyatt while listening to one of his podcasts. But it's been said, motion improves emotion. Motion improves emotion. And I think that's true. And I think that that's something that has a spiritual application that gets demonstrated here in John chapter 5. When Jesus healed this man, He didn't heal him with the expectation that this man was going to continue to spend his days lying down on that dirty, sweaty, smelly mat. His expectation for him and His command to this man was to get up and walk. Effectively saying, look, you're healed now. Get up and walk. Get up and walk. As we wrap up, let me say this. Is it too much of a stretch for us to make that kind of application to our lives as well? When Jesus singled you out, when Jesus identified your deepest need, and when He healed your broken soul, did He call you to remain in the mess that He had just lifted you out of, Or did He empower you to get into motion? So right now, if you've been discouraged, if you've been depressed, if you've been feeling anxious, is it possible that you've been going through a season where your knowledge of Jesus hasn't actually been looking much like a daily walk with Jesus? You know what I mean? Like, is it possible that you know a lot of stuff about Jesus, but right now you really haven't been getting into motion You haven't been walking with Him. You've just been knowing about Him, but not walking with Him. And what's that principle? You know, motion improves emotion. I think Jesus is looking at us, and He's saying, listen, if you trust in Me, get up. Take up that dirty, smelly bed. Don't lay in it any longer. Pick it up and walk. He's inviting us to walk with Him because the broken find healing in Jesus. So yes, there are multitudes of broken people in this world. And no, they don't all want to be healed. But those who are willing to trust Him, even when He says impossible-sounding things, are invited to walk with Him and to experience the transformative power of His presence in their lives. Don't choose to wallow in whatever's been weighing you down. Motion improves emotion. Walk with Christ by faith and give Him the opportunity to transform your heart and transform your mind and to put you into action empowered by His grace. Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for Your Word and thank You for the privilege that it is to be able to look at a portion of Scripture like this today and just meditate on these things and think about all the different things that You've revealed to us here in Your Word. Lord, we recognize that the broken find healing in You. And Lord, obviously, You're concerned for whatever infirmities we're dealing with, whether they be physical infirmities or emotional or relational or just whatever nature of infirmity, but Your deepest concern is the spiritual brokenness that we experience when we try to do life without You, when we try to use something else other than You, to fill the void that's in our souls. Lord, Your Word reveals to us that we will never be satisfied with anything less than You. There will always be a part of us that's searching and grasping and trying to find satisfaction until we find the satisfaction and rest that our souls need through You. So Lord, if we've been wrestling with these things, we pray, Lord, that You'd convince our minds and convince our hearts of these truths today. 
Pray that you'd make us men and women who recognize that you're the one who heals brokenness. Lord, we're grateful for the things that, even just in modern day, we could see you do in the life of a guy like Brian Welch. Somebody that probably a lot of people had given up on, and certainly somebody who had uh, a background that was causing him a lot of discomfort and pain and sorrow. But we're grateful, Lord, that you reached into his life and you lifted him up and you taught him to walk with you. And Lord, by your grace, we pray that you teach us the same thing. Teach us that it's good to walk with you. Teach us that we don't need to remain in what you've healed us from. We don't have to be lying in our own filth. You've picked us up. You've given us your strength to walk. Lord, we're very thankful for this, and we pray that you bring these truths to our mind throughout the course of today, throughout the course of this week, throughout the course of our lives. Thank you for being our Savior who heals the broken. And thank you again for these reminders from your word today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we'd invite you to stop by DesireJesus.com, check out the Desire Jesus one-year devotional, and sign up for our newsletter if you're not already on the newsletter. You'll find a link to that right there on the website. Again, that's DesireJesus.com. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And we look forward to catching up with you again right here next Monday. Take care.